you please to take your Bible this evening and turn to the 139th Psalm. The 139th Psalm. It's a great Psalm, right? While you're turning there, do you remember when Jesus was asked by his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And he framed a model prayer for them. It's called the Lord's Prayer, but it's really the disciples' prayer, isn't it? And as he gave that instruction, following that, he said, don't pray like the heathen do. They think that they're going to be heard for their much speaking. Don't pray like that. Why doesn't God want us to pray long, loud prayers like the heathen? Remember the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? They were crying to their false god Baal all day when there was no answer. Loud and long. Why doesn't God want us to pray loud and long? He goes on in that same passage and he said, for your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. And we perhaps have a question in our mind, then why even pray if God already knows what we're going to ask for? Well, all of these questions and more are answered when you understand the underlying truth of the 139th Psalm. There are four things in Psalm 139 that you need to know that God knows about you. Let me repeat that. Four things in this psalm you need to know that God knows about you. There's four things about you that God knows, and you need to know that God knows this about you. And by the way, when you see these four things in Psalm 139 that God knows about you, you'll be so happy he does. You really will. And I want to share them with you uh, as briefly as possible, but let's pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, just amazing. You are just amazing. As we've just sung, man looks on the outside, but God looks in the heart. And we thank you that you know us, and you know us like no one else. And Lord, there's a reason for that. And I pray that we'd see the real reason for it tonight. Give us a glimpse of your heart, and not just that you know our heart. But Lord, in doing so, show us your heart, we pray. Your heart for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing that you need to know that God knows about you is in the first six verses. And so I'm going to read them and uh, see if we can come up with that thing that he knows about you. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is it's too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain unto it. You ready? The first thing that you need to know that God knows about you is the simple truth. God knows you. God knows you. God is not some distant entity or impersonal force, but God is, if you're a believer, he's your loving, caring Abba. He has a purpose for you. And his purpose is that he wants to be intimately acquainted with you and everything that pertains to you. There are eight references in those verses that I've just read referring to what uh, all that God knows about you and every one of the verbs describing what God knows about you 
says that he knows this as his fixed habit, that it is invariable. God knows this about you. It begins with that first verb in the first verse, you've searched me. And that word searched means God has and continues to habitually make a detailed uncovering of my life, of your life, your entire life, your entire life. He he says it so clearly in the verses that we've just read. In verse 3, thou compassest my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. He is, he knows the entire direction of your personal life. Don't think of it in relation to everyone else, but to yourself. He knows the entire direction of your personal life, whether it be public or your private life. He also knows your thoughts when they're even before they're formed or being in the process of formed, he says, uh, there's not verse four, a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. And verse five, thou hast beset me behind and, and before and laid thine hand upon me. The word laid there literally is You've cupped your hand over me. I'm shut up by your cupped hand over me, which, of course, is a hand of protection. So God's knowledge of you is total. The entire dimension and direction of your life. And that just overwhelmed the psalmist David. Look at what he says in verse 6. He says, God's knowledge of me, or of you, you could say, is it's too high. It's totally unaccessible. And even if it would be possible to access God's knowledge of you, it, it would be not understandable, is what the psalmist says. So the first thought I want you to think on is that God knows you. The second thing is found in the next section. I'll read these verses, see if you can figure out what the second thing is that God knows about you. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about thee. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. The second thing I want you to know that God knows about you is that he's with you. He not only knows you, but he's with you. God never wants to be away from you. That's what these verses are saying. As an adoring, devoted papa, he never wants to let you out of his sight. He's with you all the time. He's with you in all your circumstances. In fact, when you uh, look at verse 7, The first word in that verse, wither, it it actually appears two times in that seventh verse. That word, wither, is really an invitation for you and I to explore the delightful impossibility of getting away from God. It can't happen. In fact, these verses teach that even when we wander away, his loving presence is there. Even when we wander deliberately away from him, his loving presence is there. In fact, 
He says, if I make my bed in hell. And the word hell there is the Hebrew word sheol, which actually refers to the underworld. He's there. In other words, it is just absolutely impossible to escape from Papa's personal presence. And the psalmist is saying it in, in, this, in this way. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? There's no escape. And I have no regrets. Know this. God knows you. And God is with you. Always. Here's the third truth that we find in the next section. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13, and let's see if you can figure out what it is that God knows about you. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And yet in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they're more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Third truth that God wants you to know about him, what he knows about you, is not only that he knows you and he's with you, but thirdly, he made you. He made you. And what the psalmist does is he traces, God traces your personal life from conception, that's verse 16, where he's talking about uh, being conceived in his mother's womb. God traces your personal life from conception to resurrection. That's what it means in verse 18 when he says, when I awake, I am still with thee. So God made you, and he has your personal life as your maker, as your creator. He has it totally from conception to resurrection. And God has the right of possession over you. He sees your personal life as it emerges from the womb and your public life even before it happens. That's what verse 13 is actually saying. And he is very clear to let us know that he has distinctly fashioned you to be his image bearer. That is, to be like God himself, the creator himself, not just so you represent him here on earth, but so that you would be able to personally connect with him and have fellowship with him and to share eternal life together with him as a loving, doting father with his child. He made you. And the fourth thing that God wants you to know that he knows about you is in the remaining verses. Verse 19, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect, complete hatred. I count them mine enemies. 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me or test me and know my thoughts, my intentions, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, the everlasting way. God knows you. God's with you. The psalmist also teaches that God made you. And lastly, God cleans you. 
And I'm focusing on that 23rd and 24th verse especially. When he says, search me, O God, he connects with what he started with in that first verse. Thou hast searched me. And what he's saying is he's inviting God to never stop ransacking his heart, to never start stop doing that detailed inventory and to reveal to him any way that he has wandered from the Lord, any way that his thoughts have been distracted and have, as a result, been caused uh, anxiety or any way that he has tended to veer off in a destructive direction. Whenever we veer off from God, it's in a destructive path. See, what he's saying is God's holy. And he knows a dirty heart. And he knows that a dirty heart is contaminated. And when our hearts are dirty and contaminated, they cut us off from a relationship or from at least fellowship with him. And it brings levels of destruction into our life. And as a caring father, he desires to protect us from that. He, he desires to protect you because you're his precious child from all that would hurt you spiritually or in any other way for all that would hurt you or that would hinder you from fulfilling your life's purpose. And so he constantly directs to be able, uh, he, he, he constantly wants God to direct him to be able to follow him. God knows you. He wants you to know that. I'm here to tell you tonight that the God that we read about in the Bible wrote this book for one reason, and that is to bring you to himself, that he might have a personal relationship with you and that you might have a personal relationship with him. And he reveals to us in his book, in his word, he wants you to know that he knows you, everything about you. He wants you to know that he is with you, regardless of how or what you do. He wants you to know that he made you. He made you and he's got your life covered from the moment of conception to that day of resurrection. And then he wants you to know that he can clean you. And that's something that we always need, isn't it? And when I thought about this Psalm and what God wants you and I to know that he knows about us, that he knows about you, it just dawned on me that the greatest disappointment, the greatest sorrow that you can bring to God's heart, the greatest disappointment that you can bring to the heart of God is that you are either uninterested or unwilling to be intimate with him because this is who he is. He's the one that knows you better than you know yourself. He's the one that's with you all the time in all situations. He's the one that made you to be his image bearer so that he can connect with you. And he's the one that could clean you and make your life joyful and useful. So I'm going to repeat that. That you remember what's the greatest sorrow that you can ever bring to God's heart. The greatest disappointment that you can deliver to God's heart is that you tonight, today, are either unwilling or uninterested in an intimate relationship with the Lord. I'm telling you, if anything breaks God's heart, it's that. And if that doesn't, uh, and if that's missing from your, your life as a believer, The Spirit of God is grieved. Simple as that. He's grieved. He's in grief. You know what it is to grieve? Have you lost someone you love dearly? You know the grief that wells up within you? 
the waves of grief that wash over you, sometimes just totally unexpected. God's heart is grieved when you as a believer are uninterested in an intimate relationship with him. When you as a believer are unwilling to come close to the one that knows you, is with you. May 